Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the scapula thoracic or ST joint. Before we do that, we're going to do a brief review of some of the things that we've seen in the previous two videos. And so we're going to look at a conglomerate of all the structures together and kind of see how they fit in. And then we'll look at the scapula thoracic articulation. So get some landmarks here. Here's the manubrium of the sternum. Right here we can see the two SC joints or sternoclavicular joints. Since this is an anterior view of the manubrium, this would be right here, the left sternoclavicular joint. Over here would be the right sternoclavicular joint. And we can even see the body of the sternum right here. And this line right here that's a little bit visible is the sternal angle, also called angle of Louis, also called the manubriosternal joint. Here's the first rib. Here's the costal cartilage of the first rib. And remember that the costal cartilage of that first rib articulates completely with the manubrium right here. This is the second rib. And you can see here the second costal cartilage. Notice the second rib right here, or its costal cartilage, articulates partially with the manubrium above and the body of the sternum below. So the articulation of that second rib spans over the sternal angle. Okay. Up here, this is the jugular notch of the manubrium, and then the articulation part of the manubrium with the clavicle, this is the clavicular notch. So here would be the right clavicular notch. This is the left clavicular notch. And again, if we zoom in a little bit here, this is actually the joint capsule of the sternoclavicular joint on the patient's left side. And the thickening of it anteriorly is the anterior sternoclavicular ligament. There would also be a thickening posteriorly called the posterior sternoclavicular ligament. We can also see a ligament right here. This ligament is connecting the clavicle superiorly to the costal cartilage of the first rib inferiorly. So because it's going between costal cartilage and the clavicle, it's a costoclavicular ligament. This would be the costoclavicular ligament on the other side. Those three ligaments, the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligaments, and the costoclavicular ligaments, remember those are what are directly stabilizing the SC joints on either side. We also have another ligament here that does not stabilize the SC joint, but it does connect the two clavicles. This one that spans from each clavicle across the jugular notch and also connecting to the joint capsule, this one is the interclavicular ligament. Okay, so we just took a look at the SC joint. Now we're actually going to move uh, laterally across the scapula. So we're going from the st uh, sternal end of the clavicle over to the acromial end of the clavicle. Remember the acromial end of the clavicle articulates with the acromion, right here, of the scapula. All right. This right here, this is the coracoid process of the scapula. And you can see it on the other side as well. Here's the coracoid process of the scapula. Okay. Um, right here, on the patient's uh, right side, we can actually see the two parts of the coracoclavicular ligament. Remember that those are the trapezoid ligament, which is more laterally placed, and the conoid ligament, which is more medially placed. Both of these together comprise the coracoclavicular ligament. And then right here, connecting the acromial process of the scapula to the clavicle, we have the acromioclavicular ligament. That ligament, acromioclavicular, and the two parts of the coracoclavicular ligament, which are trapezoid and conoid parts, those three are what directly stabilize the AC joint. Remember, we also have a coracoacromial ligament right here that connects the acromial process to the coracoid process. This ligament does not actually connect to the clavicle, and so therefore it cannot stabilize the AC joint but it does complete the subacromial arch as we saw in the, one of the previous videos, which is an arch between the acromion to the coracoid process that actually restricts upward translation of the humerus okay, and helps prevent uh, subluxation and dislocation of the head of the humerus from the glenoid fossa. Okay. All right, a few other things. Uh, here's the head of the humerus that's articulating with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. And we can see here the transverse humeral ligament, which is going to span between uh, the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. And we can see here, underneath the transverse humeral ligament, there's the tendon 
of the long head of the biceps brachii. We go over on this side, here's the transverse humeral ligament. Here's the tendon of long head of biceps brachii. And if you notice adjacent to that, really medially, we have the tendon of the short head of biceps brachii. They run right next to each other. And notice that the short head of biceps brachii originates on the coracoid process. Also originating on the coracoid process, we actually have pectoralis minor right here. So pectoralis minor is most medial, and then we have short head of biceps, and then going through the intertubercular groove underneath the transverse humeral ligament, we have the long head of biceps brachii. And then finally, here we have the subscapularis muscle right here, which is the anterior rotator cuff muscle. All right, so that's just a brief review of what we talked about in the previous two videos. Now let's talk about the scapulothoracic joint or the ST joint. A better name for the scapulothoracic joint is really the scapulothoracic articulation because it's not a synovial joint. It's actually what we call a muscular joint, which we'll talk about in a minute. So what is it? Well, it's an articulation between the convex surface of the posterior thoracic cage. So here's our rib cage or thoracic cage. So if you look, you can see the subscapularis muscle of the scapula uh, connecting with or articulating with the posterior part of the thoracic cage. And it's articulating with the concave surface of the anterior scapula. So here's our subscapularis. Okay, on the anterior scapula, and it's more of a concave surface. And those two surfaces are in direct contact with one another. It's not a synovial joint. It doesn't have synovial membranes. It does not have a joint capsule. It does have bursa, such as the scapulothoracic bursa, but it is not itself a synovial joint. Okay, And what happens is, is for different movements of the scapula, it will cause the scapula to glide over the thoracic cage. Okay. So this scapula can move up against the thoracic cage, it can move down, it can protract, it can come a little bit forward, it can retract, go a little bit backward, and what's happening is it's just gliding over the surface there via its articulation with the subscapularis muscle. Okay. And the bursa that are there, such as that scapulothoracic bursa, are preventing a friction between the subscapularis muscle and the posterior thoracic cage. And how does the scapula move about the surface of the posterior thoracic cage? Well, there are shoulder girdle muscles, as we'll see on the next slide, that move the scapula. And we've seen those in previous videos, right? So here's a posterior view now. But again, you can see the scapula is going to move against the posterior surface of the thoracic cage. Here we have elevation and depression. Remember, there's a few muscles that can elevate the scapula, upper trapezius, levator scapulae, Lower trapezius depresses the scapula, and when those shoulder girdle muscles move the scapula, the scapula just moves over the posterior surface of the thoracic cage. And that articulation is the scapulothoracic joint. Remember, we also have protraction and retraction of the scapula. This movement over here, this is protraction. Movement toward the midline is retraction. Remember, retraction is also called scapular adduction and protraction is called scapular abduction. Protraction was facilitated by serratus anterior and pectoralis minor, but mostly serratus anterior. Retraction is done via the middle trapezius and both rhomboid muscles, both major, which is the larger inferior one, and the minor, the smaller superior rhomboid. And then again, we've got upward and downward rotation of the scapula. So upward rotation is really rotating in this direction, sort of this arrow right there. Downward rotation would be moving it back. Okay, All of those movements right there are causing glide of the scapula against the posterior thoracic cage. And that articulation between the subscapularis muscle anteriorly and the posterior part of the thoracic cage, that is the scapulothoracic joint, or really scapulothoracic articulation. And the reason it's a muscular joint is because it's really an articulation with the subscapularis muscle. Okay. Now one quick thing to conclude this video, if we go back here to the upward and downward rotation, again, here's a really good picture that summarizes the muscles that are involved in each of those. Um, when we do upward rotation of the scapula, this is something that we might see during uh, shoulder abduction. So if you're doing lateral raises, let's say, uh, working the deltoids in the gym with a dumbbell, um, 
the three muscles that are generally upward rotators are going to be upper trapezius, serratus anterior, and lower trapezius. And this, again, just has to do with where they insert on the scapula and what direction they're able to pull. The downward rotators of the scapula are going to be the rhomboids, both major and minor, levator scapulae, and then pectoralis minor. So this is a really good summary slide right here. One more thing to cover before we conclude this video. Here's a cross section of the scapula thoracic joint, ST joint. So here's, the here's one of the ribs. We don't know which rib. Over here we see the humerus. Here's the intertubercular groove right here. Over here, this would actually be the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove, really where the greater tubercle is superiorly. Over here is the medial lip of the intertubercular groove. If we go up a little bit further, superiorly, we'd see the lesser tubercle. And we can see pectoralis major right here. We know this is pectoralis major because it's really going from where the ribs are. Remember, there are sternocostal regions of the pectoralis major origin. And then it's inserting on the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove right here. The medial lip would really be the insertion of latissimus dorsi and teres major. Also, here's the subscapularis muscle. Okay. Subscapularis is going really from uh, the anterior surface of the scapula right here. Okay. And it's going to be inserting on the lesser tubercle um, up superiorly. Okay. And then here's the trapezius muscle. Okay. Trapezius, remember, is going to originate really on the, the spine. Spinous process is all the way up to the nuchal ligament, external occipital protuberance. In any case, it's going to insert here on the scapula, okay. really more or less on the medial border region. We can also see some bursa here. Right here is the scapulotrapezial or trapezoid bursa. This is a bursa that exists between the scapula and the trapezius, again to minimize friction there. And then we have two other bursa to look at here. We have the scapula thoracic or infraserratus bursa, this one, and then this one which is the subscapularis or supraserratus bursa. So the scapula thoracic or infraserratus bursa right here is really important for reducing friction between the scapula right here and this part of the rib, and also with serratus anterior, which is this muscle right here that's spanning really over the length of the rib. Okay? So if the scapula were to move this direction, which would actually be retraction, um, it would actually reduce that friction between the scapula and the rib. This one, the subscapularis or supraserratus bursa, this is really more for reducing friction between the subscapularis muscle and the posterior wall of the rib cage or thoracic cage, which again is going to in some places be lined with that serratus anterior muscle. So reducing friction really between subscapularis and the thoracic cage via the serratus anterior muscle. And then this region in here is really just the axilla. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the scapula thoracic articulation. All it really is is just an articulation between the subscapularis muscle and the posterior wall of the thoracic cage. And all these movements of the scapula that we've talked about in previous videos, uh, they're just gliding movements. And they're gliding movements of the scapula against the thoracic wall, posteriorly. And that articulation is the scapula thoracic articulation. But of course, you do have to have some bursa in there to provide lubrication and reduce friction in those movements. And that's what we saw here on this slide. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.